morning. How you guys doing? Fantastic. You guys look wonderful. Even in the midst of all this rain, you guys look like you're refreshed, right? So you, it shows. It shows. All right. So, uh, yeah. And um, how many of you were like Packer fans? Because... Yeah, we, we know Jesus was a Packer fan. No, he was he was a Packer fan. He knew they needed Jesus and grace so much. It was crazy. He's like, I better hang out with these sinners. Uh, so. All right, well, my name is Tim Bycroft. I am glad you guys are here today. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And uh, if you've been around the Point Church a while, you know that we start every Sunday off by... Uh, re-examining why we do what we do. So if you would say it out loud with me, it should be on the screen. Uh, the Point Church exists to welcome the unchurched to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Right? Um, that's why we do what we do. We want to point people to God, right? We want to worship Him with everything that we have. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. We want to point people to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the answer to our sin problem, to our life problems, and to our eternity problem, Jesus fixed it. And so we want to follow him and point people to him uh, because of him being our Lord. And we point people to community, which simply is the church, which I believe is awesome. I love the church because we're able to come and equip one another and, and encourage one another. And that's why, you know, we're really pushing the life groups that we have. This is where... We can join together not only on Sunday mornings, but in a group of, co uh, of community with other people to, to encourage each other on this journey with Jesus Christ to become fully devoted followers of him. Um, how many of you, how many of you uh, would like to be, or when you think back, would have liked to have been, uh, or maybe in the future, you, you wanted to be like, a perfect parent. Come on. Wouldn't you want to be a perfect parent? I, I mean, I wouldn't want to be a perfect parent. <laughs> um, but we also know that if you are a parent, maybe you're a grandparent at this point, you can also say this statement. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and here's the thing. If you're here today and you've ever struggled with parenting, um, or maybe you're a parent now, or you want to be a parent in the future, and you know that struggle is real, guess what? There's a lot of people sitting around you today that have gone through the same thing or going through the same thing, okay? And so welcome to a bunch of misfit parents at the point. We're glad you're here. And that's why we're talking about over the last couple of weeks and then today, we're, we're just talking about parenting. And I tiptoe into this. I really do. I don't go running headlong into this subject. I, I kind of tiptoe into this subject because I am one of those imperfect parents. Okay? Many times my wife will say it, um, even when we're having discussions with our kids, hey, we're just trying to figure this thing out. Anybody? You know? Um, we're just trying to figure this thing out. Uh, but I do believe this, that the parenting is tough. Parenting is hard. Um, especially if you raise children like you, <laughs> right? Uh, or myself. Parenting is tough. And um, if you're a parent, you know someone who's going to be a parent, had a parent, you probably all agree that it's difficult. Um, matter of fact, Mark Twain, Mark Twain wrote this. He said, when they are 13, put them in a barrel and nail the lid shut and feed them through the knot hole. That's what he said. He said, when they turn 16, plug the knot hole. <clears throat> All right. So he knew, he understood the difficulty of parenting. And, and I got to be honest with you. I, I, I know that many of you probably have had a lot of joy of building up your story resume of your kids, a library of awesome stories of goofy stuff that your kids have done. 
And um, I remember years ago, I was just talking with some other guys this morning about this, that, <coughs> excuse me, I used to do a lot of drumming. I used to play a lot of churches. And I, I, I drummed a lot uh, before I came here. And one day this church called me up and they said, hey, uh, we just bought some new drums. Uh, they were rolling drums. They were new drums. They wanted me to come and kind of demonstrate or put on a demonstration for the church leaders and the pastor. It was, it was a little larger church. And so I went and my son, Kurt, went with me. And he's six at the time. Okay, just a little guy. And so I'm up there and I'm playing on these drums and, and Kurt is like standing right behind me, along with the music director, the senior pastor of the church, some other administrative people, some of the elders of the church. They're all just wanting to see how this thing rolls. And all of a sudden, my six-year-old son goes, hey, Dad, what the hell kind of drums are these? <laughs> now, for you future parents, I'm going to give you a little advice. Because our normal response to when a child says something that you've never heard them say before and you're taken aback by it a little bit, your normal response as a parent, and some of you parents, grandparents are going to shake your head because you know this, you're going to say, what did you say? <laughs> and their normal response is just to repeat it in case the senior pastor missed it the first time. I was a little in shock and awe. I was trying to figure out where did he hear this. And then I was just like, oh, hanging around his mom. So <laughs> you'll have your turn. You'll have your turn. My wife wants to, uh, anyway. Um, so today, what I would like to do is discuss what is our priority? As parents, what should be our number one priority? And I'm going to take it from a Christian worldview. I'm going to take it that we are fully devoted followers of Jesus. And because of that, we have a parent's priority with our children. And I'm going to give it away right up front, and then we're going to dig in and discuss it further. But I believe this. A parent's priority is to gradually transfer a child's dependence away from the parents until their dependence rests solely on God. Now, I get it. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, I, I would probably get most of us, I'm going to guess the vast majority of us would agree that a parent's responsibility is to take the dependence off of themselves with their children and make them more dependent, okay? And, and, and from a worldly standpoint, you're trying to make them independent, right? But I believe this. From a Christian worldview, we're trying to make them godly dependent, okay? And that's what I want to talk about today. When our kids are little, they depend on us for everything. They just do. And over time, we need to help them transfer their dependence away from us onto God. And to be honest with you, that's not an easy thing to do. It's really not. But it's necessary. As, as, as fully devoted followers of Jesus, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, and, and, and Sarah and Gabby, man, if you were here last week, didn't they do just an amazing job? Man, we have some of the best. We have some of the best staff that's working with our kids here ever. I love these girls. And but we're we should be leading, okay? As Christian parents, as fully devoted followers of Jesus, we should be leading or striving to lead Christ-centered families. We're leading them. You as the parents are leading that in your home. Okay? Transfer the dependence from where they're no longer dependent upon you, but solely dependent upon God, which we know is the one who's going to give them all their needs, all their peace, all their strength, eternal life, 
life to the ex fullest extent found in Jesus Christ, nowhere else, that's where we want them to land with their dependency is upon God. Now, where does this come from? Why don't we believe that this is something that we need to be doing? Um, I'm going to guess that most of you have heard of the Ten Commandments, right? The Big Ten. You've heard of this? So Moses lays out the Ten Commandments, okay? God gives the Ten Commandments to Moses. He lays them out to the Israelite nation. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And then you turn the page to Deuteronomy chapter 6, okay? So, so, so Moses has just laid out. God has given Moses the Ten Commandments. He's just laid this out to the people. You turn the page to chapter 6, and I, that's where I want to pick this up. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 1. These are the commandments, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And he says this. These are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord directed me to teach you so that, okay, you, your children... And their children after them may fear the Lord, your God, as long as you should live. As you teach your children to fear the Lord, as you teach them according to the commandments of God, not only, okay, not only will you be changed, but what I see in Scripture, and this is just one, but over and over and over in Scripture, what you see is, is if you teach your children and the next generation. It'll affect the next generation. And the next generation. If we as parents train our children not to depend upon us, or even themselves for that matter, or what they see, but instead teach them to trust in the one true God who created everything, who is the Lord of eternity, Hear me on this. Do you realize as parents, God has put something within you. It's a power to change generation after generation after generation. You hold that power. And it's given to you by God. Man, it's crazy quiet up here. <laughs> Think about that. Not only are you changing yourself change your kids, their kids, the kids after them. This is what the scripture says. But how do we do that? How do we transfer dependence from us to God? How do we transfer our, our children's dependence from us to God? All right, well, let's dig into that. And what I believe is this. Parents, it starts with us first. We got to get this right. We have to get this right. And when I say parents, can I just say grandparents, great grandparents, aunts, uncles, any of you who have influence over these kids? Can we just all join in on that? Okay. If we ever want our children to live and be impacted by God, we have to get ourselves right with God first. Okay. How do we transfer our children's dependence from us to us as parents to God? We must first love the Lord our God. We've got to get this right. We've got to get this right. We are to love God. Where does this come from? So a couple weeks ago, I talked about this thing called the Shema. The Shema was a Jewish prayer, and they prayed it often, at least two times a day. And it was a powerful prayer. It was a prayer that took love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, okay, and gave it some feet, okay? It speaks, it may be an Old Testament thing, but I, I think it speaks to us in New Testament times as well. Listen to this, the Shema. Now we're just picking this up again, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now we're in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, okay? There's one God, okay? Yahweh, God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. What does that mean? Love the Lord your God. 
How much are we supposed to love God? Notice the scripture does not say, love the, God, love the Lord your God with some of your heart, some of your mind, some of your strength, right? A percentage. Let's just give God a percentage of our lives. This says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Can I just be bold enough to say that that was one of the most dangerous things that we can do as a parent is to expose ourselves to just a little bit of God. Just a percentage of my heart. Just a part of our lives. Just uh, enough to think, hey, I'm not going to hell anymore. I've got salvation locked in. But all of our hearts. Let's be honest, in the world we live in, there's a lot of things that can distract us from loving, the God, loving God with all of our hearts, isn't there? Come on, agree with me. Please. We know this. There's all kinds of just things that are distracting us from loving the Lord our God with all of our hearts. There just is. And you know, as parents, okay, and I'm probably just going to talk to the dads for a minute on this one. Moms. You can be included on this, and I'm kind of letting you off the hook. But as dads, one of our major motivations with our kids is to provide that for them, right? This is how we show love. This is how we show care. And we want for our kids, okay, and, and for good intentions, if I can just give my kid more than I had, okay, you know, mindset, then, then I will show value for them. This is kind of how a lot of guys think. And so we pour ourselves into our work. We pour ourselves into our jobs and our careers, trying to get more things, okay? Here's the problem. What can end up happening is, as we're trying to give and give and give more value to our kids through things, through our career, through our jobs, through the money that we are making, we're not giving our children exactly what they need, which is us demonstrating that we have a deeper level with God. We have to get our relationship with God in proper order. We need to, to live and demonstrate for our kids that our career isn't number one, but God is. Because think about it. We want to provide, okay? Nothing wrong with providing. There's nothing wrong with providing. We want to provide the best opportunities. We want to send them to the best schools, get the best education, let them play soccer, be in ballet, football, baseball, gymnastics. The list can go on. We want for our kids. We organize their schedules. And sometimes we organize their schedules that they're so busy because somehow we have equated busyness with happiness. And even though we've made every game, even though we've made sure they're there at every practice, we sat in the bleachers, we watched them, we cheered them on, we even yelled at the referees and the umpires when necessary and unnecessary. <laughs> and then after that, we immediately go back to work. We go back to our careers so that we can earn more, so that they can have the greatest educations and be on the best traveling team. Be involved with everything this culture has. And what happens is we keep our kids busy, keep ourselves busy. And ultimately, what can easily happen is we keep ourselves and our kids Before long, if we're not careful, and this will upset some of you, maybe offend some of you, what can happen is, hear me on this one, we can easily become child-centered parents rather than God-centered parents. 
Our lives revolve around our children and their well-being so much, to much of a degree it should. I'm, I'm not saying that it shouldn't. But the danger is, is at some point when our kids become our everything instead of God being our everything, that's out of balance. Well, I'm here to challenge you on that because God tells us something different. You will become a better parent, a better Christ-centered family if you put God first. Jesus even said this, right? We know this. Seek first God's kingdom, his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things, including how you raise your children, okay, will be given to you. Keeping God first. Keeping God first. Great parenting starts with us prioritizing loving God first. And think about this. The overflow of you loving God and God reciprocating that and you receiving from God, the overflow of God's blessing into your life because you are making him first, don't you think that that might make you a better parent? That's how God's economy works. It's just how God's economy works. The blessings to impact your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. <laughs> Loving God and demonstrating that love to your kids far outweighs the soccer game that you're taking them to. Model that love for your kids. I want you to think soberly about this. This is a tough one. I see it all the time. We must, we must make God a top priority. If your children take precedence over your relationship with God, you've got to turn that around. You've got to turn that around. Now, I've got to throw out some disclaimers here because some of you are probably angry with me right now. <laughs> a little bit upset. Anyway, I'm not saying you neglect or don't love your kids. Hear me on that. Here's my disclaimers. I'm not saying that other activities or providing for your kids are wrong. I'm not saying that. Good grief. I'm not saying disregard your kids. I'm not saying that you can't do your absolute best for your kids. We need to love our kids. I, I'm here to tell you, you need to love on your kids with an extravagant love. And I know this, that the best way to demonstrate extravagant love is to receive extravagant love through Jesus Christ. You need to love your kids with extravagant love. You need to care for your kids as though they were a precious treasure given to you. Because your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren are a precious treasure given to you. Amen. We need to make them our priority. When we make them our priority... I'm making God first in our life. I'm, I'm just saying we've got to keep the priority in the right place. If your spouse, if your kids take the rightful position of God's place in your life, you got to get that thing turned around and put God first. Put God first. Okay? God is first in your life. If God is first in your life, and, and, and I believe this, that our God is a good God, and he is a great, amazing, heavenly father, and you model after him, what's that going to do? It's going to make you a better parent to your children. Okay? Seek him first. I'm going to meddle a little bit. I haven't been meddling yet, but I'm getting ready to. And I'll do this often. So this is fun. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> now, I know that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> but parents, don't kid yourself. 
you not coming to church, not bringing your kids to church, sends a powerful and significant message to your kids. If you don't make church a priority, you have to remember that even though you can't pick your children's friends, you can influence the environment in which they are in. You can't always pick who they're going to choose. However, especially in the early years, you have a great deal to say where they will go and the types of environment that they will associate in. Involvement in church. Let's just talk about that for just a second. Because some of you, you're not sitting like this on the outside, but you are on the inside. I don't really get it. I get it. But involvement in church is simply saying when your kids are seeing it, they're perceiving this. That I'm a participant in the body of Jesus Christ. That's what we are. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. Right? If you're a Christian, you're part of the church. And we get to gather, you know, in, in different settings at different times together as a body of Christ to worship God. Showing that he is a priority in our lives. Together. And I'm there in this midst of this biblical function. I have a biblical function in the church to play and and I'm immersed in deep, growing relationships with, with other people in this biblical community. And, and I'm contributing part of God's family. I, I am contributing to this family. And I'm plugged in. And, and, man, I'm part of the family of God. And it shows because we're gathering with the other people who are part of the family of God. And I love God with every fiber of my being. And therefore... I love his church. Did you hear me on that? If you're a follower of Jesus, you love his church. It's broken. It's messy. And one of the reasons is you're part of it. And I'm part of it. And I love you. And we love each other. Even in the great mess that we create. And you demonstrate that to your kids. You let them see that. That you can get along with other imperfect people. Because of the grace of God. And they see that. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. That means not only with your words, but also with your actions. And so one of the things that we have to ask is, do I love God with all of my heart? Do I just love God with some of it? And do my kids see that? Because it starts here first. It starts here first. Not just with what you say or what you hope, what you pretend for things to be, but what you really are. You see, as parents, the best thing that we can do for our children is to love God with all of our heart. Love God with everything that we have. If you haven't been, let me take a step back. Because some of you, you might be sitting here today going, man, that is just not me. I want it to be, but it's just not me. I've been there. I'm that parent. There's times where I wish I could go back. I have regrets. Like regrets. Or regret. I have regrets. I'm sure many of you have regrets. I wish I could go back. I haven't always led like I should as a Christian. I haven't always been loving. But I want you to lean into this if you would. If that is you, if you have regrets, if you haven't been loving or leading the way that you should, I'm glad you're here. Welcome. We're all working. It's a struggle. And man, I don't know about you, but I need to know that there's other people who are struggling through some of the same things that we're struggling through. And there shouldn't be any place better than the church for that to happen. I'm glad you're here. God's grace is so amazing. God's grace, no matter how much you think you've messed up, no matter what your relationship has been with him, God is willing to meet you where you are at. And I would say this, today may be the day. 
that you say, you know what? Today, we're going to lead, and I don't care if it's just with my kids or my grandkids or the kid next door, the kids that I have influence in. Today, we're going to lead Christ-centered families, and it's going to start here with me. Because I know this, that God is sitting on the edge of his throne waiting for someone, waiting for each of us to just make that step towards him. And he's willing to, willing to meet you right there and say, let's go. Let me empower you. Let me encourage you. Let me provide for you. Let me help you. When, when, when things seem like they're going off the tracks, let me bring you wisdom and peace during those times. And God is willing to do that. And maybe today is the day where you say, you know what? I haven't been leading and I haven't been loving. But today, we're making a change in our family. And it starts right here. It starts right here. Today can be that day. It can be that day where you say, God, if nothing else, I'm putting you first. I'm putting you first. And we will lead our family towards God. That's what we're called to do. Read on Deuteronomy 6. Spiritual leadership is represented in these verses. It says this. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Now, impress them upon your children. Talk about them when they sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them to your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. We are to impress God upon our children. We talk about them when we sit at home, when we drive in the car, when you're going to the soccer game, when you're going to the baseball game, when you're going to the football game, when you're bringing your kids to alt, when you're bringing your kids to the bridge, when you're bringing kids to the church, when you're taking them to school, when you're waiting in line at the school, you're talking about God. God becomes a natural thing that you talk about in your home. Not just something off to the side that once in a while we talk about. When things get tough, we talk about. Or on Sunday morning, the first words out of your mouth are, hey, we got to go worship God. And that's about all the extent of what God gets talked about in your home. No, you make God a normal part of your conversation. You write him. You talk about him. You tie him on your forehead. You tie him on your elbow. You tie him on your feet. You tie it to your steering wheel of your car. I don't care where you've got to put a reminder that God is first, and my kids are going to know it. My kids are going to know it. Spiritual talk becomes not just something you do on the weekends at church. It becomes a seven-day-a-week thing that we talk about. Listen, this is so important. Parents, parents. Okay, parents, grandparents, hear me on this. You lead the spiritual life in your household. Parents, you are the leaders. Can I encourage you one more time with that? Parents, you are the leaders. I think I need to say that again. Parents, you are the leaders. Parents, you lead your children. We live in a culture that is trying to flip-flop that so much that I think parents are intimidated to be leaders in their homes. I know it's happened in the school. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> the inmates are running the assignment. Anyway. Edward Duke, of, uh, Edward Duke of Windsor, he said this about America. He came and visited America, and he said, the thing that impressed me most about America is the way the parents obey their children. <laughs> Sad commentary. But you see it. You see it. Parent, the question are, are you leading your children, or are your children leading you? You lead them spiritually. You set the tone spiritually in your home. Parents, God, hear me on this. Maybe this is the greatest takeaway that some of you have today. I don't know. This is important for me, for my household. Parents, God has given you a divine authority in your household. 
God has given you a divine authority in your households, you set the spiritual tone. Now you say, well, how do we lead like that? How, how do we do that? I, I don't know what that looks like, especially in this culture. And, and to be honest with you, I can't tell you the specifics on what you need to do in each one of your households. But I would say this. I believe more than ever in our culture today, you have to, you have to, you have to lead with intentionality. Be intentional with the spiritual uh, guidance in your home. You have to. Whatever that means for you, you seek God, you seek the heart of God, and you do it. And you be intentional about kids seeing and learning who God is. I feel like I need to say this. Whatever. I'll say it anyway. Parents, um, I just re want to remind you that your kids are never your peers, ever. And here's what I mean by that. Parents, you are so much more than their peers. You are, you are so much more than their best friend. They're going to have all the peers that they want in their lifetime. They may have multiple best friends in their lifetime. They only get one set of parents, and that is you. Be the best parents you can be. Be the best leaders that you can be in your household. And here's the thing. As parents, one of the greatest things that we get to do is you get to lead your children. You get to direct them, and you get to love on them, and you get to encourage them, and you get to equip them. And of course, what a lot of their peers aren't going to do, and what some of the their best friends probably aren't going to do is we get to course correct them. We get to do that. As a matter of fact, you need to do that. You aren't meant to follow them. You're meant to lead them. You are the parent. <laughs> Hear me on this. You are the parent, and they don't always get equal say in every decision. That only comes with time and trust. God says, parents, you lead and you impress upon them the truth about who I, ever, about who I am. Now, I understand this. I can't carry the weight of their response. That's a big one. My heart is heavy sometimes with the response, okay? But I can't control their response. My responsibility is to impress God upon them. To impress God upon them, to impress God upon them, to impress God upon them. But they get to choose what they're going to do with that information. Okay? Let me tell you what God does not say. God does not say, hey, leave it up to your kids what they're going to decide about who I am. God never says that. This is one of the greatest lies that Satan has used to deceive this generation. If you believe that God says, hey, just let them figure out who I am, I hate to say this, then you've been deceived. Because God never said that. He said the opposite. You impress upon them who I am. Impress upon them. Let me say it again. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy what God loves and what you love, and that is your family. Satan wants to take your kids away from you. He wants to destroy them, and he will use any means possible to do that. This is sobering stuff. The Bible is very clear. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Satan is here to steal, kill, and destroy what God loves most. And I guarantee you what you love most. Your families. Your kids. 
That means, parents, we stand on the line. We're on the line. We're called to stand as the spiritual leaders, as the spiritual heads in our home. Therefore, we don the full armor of God and we go to battle for our kids. You defend your family from those who seek to destroy and kill your family. Someone or something is going to influence your kids and grandkids. You hear me on that? Someone or something is going to influence your kids. It needs to be you. You leave your kids alone. You don't model to them. You don't talk about God with them. And I'm telling you, this world is going to be a bigger influence on them than you are. Satan controls this world, and he wants nothing more than to hurt God, and he does that by destroying those God loves. And I will tell you something. Over the last 10 years, parents, this is a fight. Because they have influence right here. That, man, I'm telling you something. I think we're running to keep up to have better influence over our kids than this phone does. Satan is using this tool. God can use this tool, right? God can use this tool. I want to use this tool for God, but I'm telling you something with our kids. The, the fight is on. The fight is on. And we can't shrug it off as Christian parents. We just can't. from a different angle here. How many of you who are parents in here believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? You know who Jesus Christ is. You, you know the importance of Jesus. Uh, the, the good news, think, think about it this way. The good news of Jesus Christ who brings salvation for eternity for people who have sinned. Who sinned? All of us have sinned. We've ne needed rescued from our sin. Jesus was the rescuer. We need salvation from our sin. Jesus brought salvation for our sins. Jesus Christ is the good news, the best news that has ever happened on this planet. Would you agree? Yes. Parents, would you agree? Yes. You'd also have to agree that you want your children to know that, right? You want your children to know the good news of Jesus Christ. You want your children to know that there is salvation for eternity in the presence of God. A good God. A gracious God. A loving God. Can I just say, don't leave that to chance? Don't leave that to chance. Well, yeah, but it's him, Pastor I don't want to push them away. Man, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. I don't want to, I don't want to force them. I don't want to push them away. And when someone says that, my question is always like, push them away from what? You mean the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ? You mean push them away from the best news that has ever happened on this planet by the creator himself? I know that you can't force your kids. You can't force anyone. Nobody can force you to receive that good news. But by golly, I'm going to do the best I can to make sure that people hear it, and particularly the most important important people in my life, which are the people that God gave me, my kids. God says, share it with them. Pass on the good news. Keep the end goal in mind. I want you to know that here at the church, we're doing our best to partner with you guys. 
We want to partner with the parents and the grandparents and the aunts and all. Those of you who are raising this next generation, this next generation, I, man, I have high hopes in this next generation. I really do. They're going to be a powerful bunch of people because they've had a powerful amount of information given to them. And when they get it all sorted out, they're going to do some stuff. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I want them to do it for the cause of Jesus Christ. And we want to partner with you. We want to help you. Whether it's Sarah or Gabby or myself or any of the leadership team, people in your life group, man, I just encourage you, man, if you're struggling with your kids or at home or, man, you're struggling personally, but you want to be that leader in your home, talk about it. It's okay. Because I guarantee you, nobody around here was a perfect parent. They probably went through some of the same struggles you've been through or are going through some of the same struggles you're going through. Man, let's talk about it. That's the most powerful thing we can do is to expose it to the light. If you keep it in the darkness, Satan wins. You expose it to the light. Odds are God's going to help you, right? We know this. So expose your children to the great truths of God. Teach them about his power and his goodness. Teach them how the power of prayer and the truth of his word impacts your life. Teach them of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your life that brings empowerment and leads to counsel and guidance and correction and, and teaching. Expose your children to that. Here's the thing. We have to work at it. We have to be intentional with it. Can I just tell you something? It's hard work. Parents, it ain't easy. Being a parent ain't for sissies, man. It's hard work. And therefore, my encouragement to you today is this. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Keep trying. Never stop. Keep loving. Keep demonstrating grace. Keep setting those boundaries. There's no perfect parents. We know this. But we're all trying to figure this out together. It's going to get messy. It's going to get messy. But God's grace carries far outweighs any mess that we find ourselves in. Praise God. However, with God's help, with God's help, and not just with God's help, but with the help of the church family, we're going to offer this next generation a solid foundation set upon the truth of God. Will you pray with me? Now to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. <laughs>